Okay, well, hello everyone, and welcome to the romantically named Panel F. Let me introduce myself. My name is Joseph Noss, and I work here in Basel at the Financial Stability Board Secretariat, and I have the pleasure of moderating uh, this session today. We have been charged with discussing the true resilience of our financial systems to climate change or climate related risks with the buffers that we currently have. This is clearly a very complex issue uh, and I am I have ringing in my ears the uh, remarks of uh, Mark Carney earlier where he said that we should try and avoid a situation where society makes certain choices with respect to climate change uh, but choices whose consequences, uh, financial consequences, cannot be um, absorbed by the, by the uh, financial system. Um, so with me to discuss these issues are six fantastic panellists that are hopefully uh, appearing on your screen. First, Natalie Orfevre, uh, who is Director General for Financial Stability and Operations at the Banque de France. Second, uh, Acting Chair Benham of the US Commodity Futures and Trading Commission. Sarah Breeden, who is Executive Director at the Bank of England. Alejandro Diaz de Leon, who is Governor of the Bank of Mexico. Glenn Rudbush, Senior Policy Advisor and Executive Vice President at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. And last but not least, Uli Volz, who is Director of the Center for Sustainable Finance and a reader in economics at SOAS University of London. And a warm welcome to you all, and thank you uh, for, for joining us virtually today. So in terms of how we run things, we have an hour and 15 minutes. I'm going to ask Glenn to kick us off, and I'm then going to pose a couple of questions uh, to our panelists, which they'll be able to answer uh, in turn. I'm going to leave plenty of time or aim to leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So please, audience, those of you who are listening, please get thinking about your questions and enter them in the uh, chat box that should be uh, available on the left of your screen so I can see them uh, and pose those questions or some of those questions at least um, to our panel. Now, Glenn, I confess that seven years ago, I was working at the Bank of England in financial stability, working for Sarah, in fact, and there dropped into my inbox a request from Mark Carney's office to think at relatively short order about the financial stability implications of climate change. And I, I have to admit, I was a little bit of a skeptic, not that climate change mattered or didn't matter for, for society, but my question, I think to Sarah as my ultimate boss at the time was, well, how is this thing, climate change, different to any other risk that we're used to thinking about when we look at how banks or the UK financial system? And how is it different to any other form of, you know, structural economic change? Seven years on, um, our thinking, our collective thinking has evolved, uh, mine certainly has. But Glenn, can you tell us a little bit about what you see the answer to my question to be? You know, what are the risks to the financial system from climate change? How do they differ to other risks to financial stability? And why should we be concerned about them? Glenn. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that. Let me first thank the organizers of this very special conference, especially the Banque de France which has shown exceptional leadership on, on climate risk. Um, I'm at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco, but of course my remarks are my own and do not necessarily reflect the views of others at the Federal Reserve. Climate change increases the size and frequency of shocks and disruptions to the economy. This results in greater risk to asset classes, financial markets, balance sheets, credit availability, and the stability of the financial system. In addition to boosting the severity of shocks, climate change can increase financial vulnerabilities. The associated reduction in financial resilience means that greater damage would result from a shock of any given size. 
These climate-related risks from increased shocks and vulnerabilities often operate through traditional risk categories, such as credit risk, market risk, and operational risk. However, compared to risks from other forms of structural change, and this gets to your question, Joe, uh, I think climate risk has several unusual features that make it uniquely problematic. One of these, is, of course, is the time horizon. Climate risk operates at multiple time horizons. We've already seen some climate hazards are already being realized now, but others will take decades to resolve. These unusual, very long horizons do not mean that financial institutions, regulators, and investors can wait to act. Instead, the distant horizons require taking a unique long-term perspective for identifying and managing risk. A second feature is complexity. We usually model the complex interactions within the economy. Those give us enough, enough trouble, really. But now climate risk overlays on these economic dynamics a set of complicated climate dynamics as well. These climate dynamics, frankly, have a lot of moving parts. They're nonlinearities, they're feedback effects. They're also potential tipping points, which make some climate change damages effectively irreversible. A third aspect is uncertainty. Of course, uncertainty is a given in risk management. That's not special. But I think the level and form of climate risk uncertainty is deeply, uh, deeply troubling. Climate risk probabilities can diverge sharply from the past, as when so-called 100-year floods occur every other year. So the historical record is less useful for calibrating this type of uncertainty. The relevant probability distributions have fat tails and potentially catastrophic outcomes. Finally, some amount of climate-related financial risk is unavoidable, but whether it will be predominantly uh, physical risks or transition risks is unknown. Fourth, let me mention opacity. Climate change is both unprecedented in our recorded history and probabilistic, and those two qualities make climate change very difficult to understand and communicate. Uh, this opaqueness, this opacity can lead to a wide dispersion in investor perceptions, especially if the science becomes politicized, as we have seen with epidemiology during the pandemic. Divergent views and beliefs about climate change can set the stage for sharp asset price realignments. Uh, if investors have these different views, it may make price discovery more difficult. Climate-related losses can then lead to cascading shifts in the risk perceptions of investors, as well as the abrupt repricing of loans, securities, and other assets. In this way, climate-related losses which are correlated and difficult to price could create vulnerabilities for financial stability. Finally, there's one last attribute I want to highlight and that's heterogeneity. Climate change is of course global, but the effects of climate change are local. Climate risks will be different, indeed will vary widely depending on location, sector, asset class, and exposure. Physical climate risks are extremely heterogeneous. Two assets or properties that are locationally almost adjacent to each other can, be, can face very different climate risks. The key question for risk identification is, what is the geospecific climate sensitivity of a particular asset? How will heat or drought or sea level surge or storm intensity locally affect that asset's economic viability and value? A property just slightly farther from the ocean will have greatly reduced climate-related flooding risk. Similarly, moving to the transition risks, transition risks associated with policy changes, technological innovations and shifts and in consumer or investor preferences can also have heterogeneous impacts on different industries and assets in different locations. So to sum up, time horizon, complexity, uncertainty, opacity and heterogeneity as a result of these challenges, climate-related risks require new perspectives, innovative strategies, and tailored supervisory approaches. 
Joe, is that a, is that a good kickoff for our for our discussion? Thank you, Glenn. That's uh, very thoughtful and a fantastic uh, uh, introduction to our discussion. There's a lot there. There's a lot to think about. Uh, there's frankly uh, a lot to worry about for those charged uh, for safeguarding the financial system. Let me ask the panelists now, which of those faucets of climate-related risks worries you most or is there anything uh, that you'd like to add or or augment uh with respect to glenn's uh remarks who'd like to come in uli please yeah hello and first of all thanks a lot for for having me a really exciting conference and, and panel um so i'd like to to add one uh, complexity um to to what glenn said and that's uh, the the great importance of transboundary risks uh, so that is uh, risks that are um, emanating from cross-border spillovers uh, and that may relate both to physical and transition impacts that are happening somewhere and uh, i think this is a, a risk that that has not been uh, investigated sufficiently thus far. I think we, we need to pay much more attention uh, to these transboundary spillovers. And, and uh, so, for example, when we talk about stress testing, scenario analysis and so on, uh, I think we, we need to add this dimension. And of course, it's another layer of complexity, but, but I think it's, it's absolutely crucial that we uh, try to, to, to uh, plug that in. Great point, Uli. Yes, definitely another layer of uh, definitely another <laughs> another layer to add to the many layers that, that Glenn mentioned of of complexity. Um, just while we're on this point of the sort of nature of climate related risks, is there anyone else who'd like to uh, react to Glenn's remarks? Alejandro, please. Yes, uh, Joseph. Uh, first, uh, it's an honor to be part of uh, of this very distinguished panel. And let me first give one, uh, let's say, a cautionary tale and then a couple of thoughts. Um, since the avian flu or the old SARS episodes, there was awareness that another pandemic event would happen sooner or later. Nonetheless, we were clearly not ready for the challenges COVID-19 entailed. And this resulted in an unprecedented shock for the global economy. The COVID pandemic is a cautionary tale. We must enhance our resilience in face of the imminent climate change shocks. The probability of climate risks materializing is high, even though the timing is uncertain. There is little time to act to increase resilience and prepare to better manage these risks. And let me highlight two points. With climate events, we are on the realm of what we know as Nightian uncertainty that Glenn was talking about. We do not know their distribution functions. Moreover, the existence of tipping points implies that small changes in temperature could have severe consequences for our well-being, non-linear effects. Clearly, it is essential to avoid reaching such tipping points. And the second one, climate change will impact adversely some countries more than others. Tropical and subtropical regions are likely going to be more affected by climate-related events. Thus, LDCs and emerging economies are more exposed and are also uh, less resilient uh, to cope with these uh, challenges. Thank you, Joseph. Thanks, Alejandro. And it's interesting, isn't it, how some of the language that we use for talking about financial risks, nighty and uncertainty, and for talking about financial policies is starting to creep into and enter the debate about epidemiology and, 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 and vice versa. Before we come on to the solutions, uh, does anyone else want to come in on the, on the risks? Sarah, please. Sarah, sorry, we can't hear you i don't know if the problem is uh yeah. your end or ours right. Joe, Sorry, can I just like... jump in maybe while please I... yeah please i think Jeff. The, the two thoughts in response to glenn i mean glenn pointed out uh, uh appropriately all at least many of the risks that we're facing and the unique nature of the climate risk but two things that i think from my perspective from a market's perspective the opacity and the non-linearity of the, of the risks, right? We, we're not we're not traditionally uh, used to the risks that climate change poses. Um, they are not clear, and this is really, I think, a, a heart of the debate that we're having about material risks and the disclosures and the transparency that I think the investor, the regulator, the commercial producer um, needs to sort of figure out, right? Because when we think about financial market risks and traditional financial market risks, whether it's 
uh, operational risk, technology risk, cyber risk, uh, risk from competitors in your business. These are the types of things that I think traditional firms have dealt with for decades. Uh, and now that we're starting to really examine and unpack the risk that climate change poses, as, as Glenn pointed out, we really need to rethink how we as both supervisors and market regulators think about these risks because they are nonlinear and they are very opaque and we're not gonna be able to predict them even in the short term, let alone the midterm and long term as the horizon goes out further. So this is gonna require, I think, flexibility and, and as I've said many times, it's sort of uh, an iterative process because we can set or establish a structure or framework for regulation and supervision now but it could easily change in a few years based on science and based on what the climate is going to sort of, how it's going to adapt and how it's going to change over time. And that I think none of us are used to, that our markets are not used to that and our traditional way of assessing and pricing risk is not accustomed to that. And I think that's going to be uh, one of the biggest challenges we face. Uh, thank you, Acting Chair Benham. And I was struck by Glenn's remark at the start that some financial regulators at least are very used to thinking about non-linearities of the financial system and real economy and the interaction of the financial system and the real economy introduced but i suppose with climate change we're dealing with a with a risk that's fundamentally non-linear in 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 nature so that's a really good point um let me turn now to uh another question for, for all the panelists and i'll put this to you in turn um we've heard and thought a little bit about the risks what solutions would you propose to address these. Let me turn to you each in turn. Uli, I think we're going to start with you. Uli. Yeah, well, I mean, clearly there, there's no, no silver bullet. It, it's a super complex issue and, and a lot of things have to happen. But I, I would suggest that um, we really need to invest a lot in properly analyzing and measuring these risks. So, at the, you know, we, we have made great advances over the last couple of years in conceptualizing the risks. So we kind of, uh, can figure out how this works, but but actually for for most countries, I'd say actually for all countries, we don't have proper assessments of how uh, relevant different types of risks are. I mean, maybe some some rough estimates for some countries, but for most countries we don't. So I think we need to to take a holistic approach. We need comprehensive assessments of vulnerabilities across financial systems and economies at large. So we we should not focus only on the financial system. And I would argue that it's absolutely crucial that central banks and supervisors work together uh, with other branches of government uh, to, uh, to, to conduct comprehensive um, analyses of macro financial risks facing their economies to identify where the main vulnerabilities lie and then consider how uh, these risks can be mitigated and managed. And I'd like to suggest uh, three actions that I, I consider uh, key. So first, um, I think we really need each and every country to conduct a very comprehensive vulnerability assessment um, that would form the basis of a kind of uh, national adaptation plan. And uh, in, in a recent study, uh, we recommended that such an assessment should be conducted by a dedicated national climate risk board, yeah, where you have the central bank and, and supervisors who are, of course, the ones who, who understand best about uh, financial risk, macroeconomic risk, uh, but also bring in key government ministries, including finance, economy, planning, to really have this holistic perspective. But, I mean, however you call uh, such a review, uh, it's really important that it's a systematic assessment of all sources of vulnerability to the macroeconomy, the financial system, uh, and public finances, which can also be very heavily affected by climate change. Um, and uh, that, of course, has to involve uh, scenario planning, uh, uh, scenario analysis um, uh, 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 that would then also look at socioeconomic change and so on. Um, the second uh, point I want to highlight is that, uh, and I think that's fairly obvious, but, but always worth repeating, uh, that central banks and supervisors really need to adjust their monetary and prudential frameworks to account for climate risk and thereby help to mitigate uh, and better manage these. And, and there's a, a couple of uh, issues which uh, I think are, are uh, in a way no-brainers. And, and I think, I mean, having listened to, to the opening speeches, I think this is becoming mainstream now. So we clearly need uh, mandatory disclosure of climate and other sustainability risks 
We need uh, regular climate stress testing of financial institutions. Um, we need to have uh, climate risks being mainstreamed in prudential supervision, both micro and macro, um, and also uh, uh, um, uh, monetary um, uh, uh, policies need to be aligned. So kind of asset purchase programs, collateral frameworks, and so on. Um, and we've made a couple of suggestions to this effect in, in a recent report on net zero central bank. Um, and then thirdly, um, monetary and financial authorities also need to consider how they can help develop and implement financial sector policies uh, that will help to scale up investment in climate adaptation and resilience, which we really need uh, very urgently uh, across all countries. And, and also, uh, for example, how, how they can support the development of insurance solutions, which for many, many developing countries is really uh, completely lacking. And um, so I'd like to highlight the market shaping role uh, that central banks and supervisors have in supporting uh, uh, development of certain segments of financial market that ca can help address climate risk better. So, for example, if we look at developing emerging markets, uh, I think they have a strong case for central bank supervisors to support the development of capital markets. Yeah? So local currency bond markets that, that can be used to uh, uh, finance uh, climate resilient infrastructure. Or uh, I mentioned already development of insurance markets. And just to finish off, uh, I think one important example that, that really needs to become much more uh, prominent is financial authorities can really uh, seek to promote uh, the use of sustainable digital finance, which I think offers a lot of interesting opportunities. So I think they're really beyond the kind of risk mitigating and analyzing uh, 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 roles that central banks and supervisors have. I think there's definitely also this market shaping, market building role. Um, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julie. And I just add that withdrawal or lack of insurance coverage, certainly a problem in, in emerging markets something we're starting to find and, and see in our work at the FSB, is it starting to, there's starting to be a lack of insurance coverage in some advanced economies as well, try insuring uh, properties in the UK, for example, where I'm from, that are close to water co <laughs> courses, and there's, there's starting to be issues there as well. Sarah, great to have you back. Hopefully we can, we can keep you online. Um, Here's hoping. Can I turn to you next? You've been thinking a lot about scenario analysis in your work with colleagues at the Bank of England. Can you tell us a little bit about that and the degree to which that can uh, help provide a solution in terms of the measurement of risk? Well, as Glenn described, the challenge that we have in sizing and understanding these risks is absolutely enormous. We need to look decades ahead we need to look at risks at a really granular level and the methodologies and the data that we have to support all of that analysis is far from where we want it to be. So to support that, we need to transform risk management by embedding it uh, in individual firms and as well considering it at the level of the system so that we're all prepared for risks that might end up materializing. And as you said, Joe, given the variety of future pathways and the time horizon over which climate is going to impact financial risks, in our view, scenario analysis is a key tool in that process. We are not saying what will happen. We are looking at what might happen. In that context, in the UK, we expect firms to run climate scenarios as part of their business as usual risk management and embed that into their day to day decision making. And next week in the UK, we're going to be launching our climate scenario exercise, CBES, asking the largest banks and the largest insurers in the UK to test their resilience to climate risks. Consistent with the nature of the risk that we've just described, we're going to be looking ahead decades. We are going to be basing it on granular data and we'll be looking at three different scenarios. So it's a really tough ask uh, for the firms.
But since the challenges and costs of creating those scenarios against which to judge your future risk profile are beyond the capacity and capability of most individual firms and institutions, the NGFS has developed a set of common climate scenarios in recognition of the uncertainty we face about what might happen to our planet and our economy some scenarios show the most efficient pathway to net zero others highlight the risks of late policy or fragmented policy others highlight the risks of insufficient action and together uh, i think joe they allow us to explore the bookends of possible future uh, risks um, a new updated set of NGFS scenarios are going to be released on Monday. They are much improved on uh, the ones we had uh, uh, released last year, consistent with the theme of uh, the Uli mentioned of uh, continual improvement. Uh, but I do encourage everyone to take a look and indeed use them for their own risk analysis. Thanks, Sarah. Bank of England clearly got, got a lot, has a lot of uh, interesting work underway here, but so too, I know, does uh, the Banque de France. Natalie, could you tell us a little bit about some of the work that, uh, that uh, the Banque de France has underway uh, on this issue and what some of the key kind of learnings might be in terms of how we, how we advance the debate? Uh, thank you very much, and I would like to thank the organisers for inviting me in this uh, conference. Um, I think that uh, uh, we have three important levers uh, to address those uh, very complicated risks and I, I would like to try to, to mention the, these three uh, levers. Um, first, since climate related risks uh, have now been clearly identified as a source of financial risk, and it was the first part of this panel, it is crucial to raise awareness about these risks share best practices and enhance capacity building. Uh, and here, uh, central banks and supervisors have clearly uh, to do their part of the job within their mandate, of course, uh, to address this risk and incentivize the whole financial community to identify and manage these risks. And uh, I would like to underline that the NGFS has been a remarkable catalyst uh, to this end. Uh, Sarah has just mentioned uh, the scenario analysis work, but uh, I really think it was uh, even broader uh, because its quality of the winning philosophy has definitely helped a lot to increase awareness among our community. You know that now we are more than 90 members and it inspires its members to take action by providing guidance and, and share knowledge. So it's, it's the first uh, action, and I think it's very important because these risks are very complex. So we need to learn and to, to really build capacities. My second point is that we need to develop proper tools. It was already mentioned by uh, previous speakers uh, because of the specificity of these risks. Uh, we need uh, first to improve the disclosure by non-financial corporate and financial institutions and bridge some uh, critical data gaps. As uh, Sarah mentioned, we need very granular data in order to cope with the heterogeneity of exposure to climate risk across sectors, but even across firms in the same industry. Uh, and also current disclosures are often hardly comparable, uh, which makes it difficult to process them on a large scale with reliable results. Therefore, we also need to develop harmonized regulatory framework and common metrics. And of course, as uh, Sarah mentioned, we need to develop uh, tools like uh, scenario analysis. I won't uh, say more about it. And my last point is that uh, central banks uh, should lead by example. It is really our, our uh, main convention at the Bank de France Firstly, they should lead by example regarding their own decisions uh, as institutional investors. We should apply sustainable and responsible strategies to our own portfolios in order to practice what we preach, uh, manage our risks and better understand also the concrete challenges uh, of green finance. Uh, 
secondly, beyond financial stability, climate change also matters for our price stability mandate. Uh, so I am uh, fully aligned with um, what has been said by Uli. Uh, at the Bank de France, we believe that central banks should recalibrate their monetary policy tools to take into account uh, climate-related risks because the effects uh, uh, of climate change will have an impact on both uh, inflation and growth. And here, uh, it means that uh, we need to adapt our forecasting models. Uh, we could also require transparency from our counterparties regarding their exposure to climate-related risks. And lastly, we could start to reduce our exposure to climate risk across all of our operations. And as a first step, we think that the euro system could decarbonize its balance sheet and collateral assets in a gradual and targeted manner for all uh, corporate assets. I think uh, this would have several positive effects, not only uh, on our side, uh, on our balance sheet, but I think also it would nudge firms and financial institutions toward reducing their exposure to climate-related risks. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Natalie. Really interesting. And listening to you and Sarah, it strikes me that, you know, scenario analysis has clearly represented a leap forward and, and the work that's gone on there has really improved central banks' ability to think about some of these risks. But as you said, I mean, these are complex, complex risks. They're acting on very complex institutional balance sheets, banks, insurance firms, etc. So maybe something we'll, refer, we'll return to in the next round of questions or in the Q&A is what the, what the residual work to be done there might be in terms of uh, thinking about these risks. So that's, uh, you know, risks to financial firms, to central banks. Acting uh, Chair Benham, I was hoping you could talk to us a little bit about uh, risks to financial markets as well. I was struck by what Glenn said at the start about the possibility that climate change results in a, a radical and widespread repricing of risk uh, across markets, uh, across financial securities. Could you tell us a little bit about the, the, the work that's going on there, uh, including on the part of the CFTC? Thanks, Joe. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I first have to say thanks to the organizers, Banque de France, BIS and GFS for, for hosting and having me here. And, like Glenn, these these opinions are my own and don't represent the commission or my uh, anyone at the CFTC. I think from a markets perspective, you know, the goal is really creating market standards for incorporating climate risks into asset valuation, and that means I think in many respects embedding carbon risk into markets so that we can fully incorporate the overall impact of an activity at any point in a life cycle in throughout a supply chain. And I think that that is a very, very challenging task, but one can see how, you know, looking at the value chain or the supply chain of a, a commercial, um, we have to be able to identify where that risk is, where what risks that uh, carbon footprint poses and how we can price that into asset valuations. So I don't think this is necessarily about creating, you know, new buckets or tranches of what we have historically done, but integrating physical and transition risk into asset allocations. And I think that's a strategy that we have to really think about, uh, put it force, uh, enforce it, and then obviously test it over time. There, there are certainly also analytical and financial challenges, I think, in determining how to best prove the concept of a feedback loop. You know, we hear this often uh, in, in this space, the feedback loop of uh, sort of recurring challenges in the climate space. What's the right process? What are the incentives? You know, I think, in my view, the greatest risk is valuation and proper valuation, both from an investor side and a regulatory side. And I think if we can get that right, then the incentives and the support structures will manifest and that will create a much clearer vision of what the risks are and how we can avoid them, and then ultimately how we can allocate capital away from that. Um, disclosure, as has been mentioned by several of my fellow panelists, is, is certainly one major piece of the equation but it's not necessarily enough to move capital. I think taxonomies uh, will help and that solution needs to be global. You know, we're seeing obviously in the EU, EU a well-developed taxonomy, the US will probably follow shortly. Uh, and globally, we need to have a taxonomy because if we're gonna have differences, however small or big, there's gonna be, you know, regulatory arbitrage opportunities there and in the climate risk and climate sort of um, 
prevention space, we really don't have room for arbitrage. Uh, there's an immense amount of capital that's growing from an investor standpoint, and I think we just have to create better incentives. Engagement is another key, uh, uh, I think, critical point that we have to think about. Risk management can't be necessarily centered on avoidance. There has to be action, and there's certainly many ways to manage climate-related environmental risk, and I think regulators can provide the necessary tools to raise both awareness and then identify solutions. And I think creating, and this is another important thing, creating and verifying strong environmental markets. We're seeing the growth of this uh, in, in separate, uh, across the country, certainly here in the US. Carbon offset markets are, are gonna be needing to set a price on carbon um, so that we can integrate that price globally. Um, we need to ensure the integrity of these markets as we have, and we continue to see this from both countries and, and corporates, commitments to net zero or net negative uh, over the next few decades. We're gonna need a strong, robust, uh, carbon offset market. And this is going to create, I think, and really represent environmental progress, understanding the challenges of greenwashing and the integrity issues, which I, I mentioned. Derivatives exchanges have a long history of, of developing and enforcing standards for derivatives contracts and environmental and weather derivatives. So I think there's clearly a space for this. We need to really, I think, let the market decide if this is happening. Uh, with a task force on scaling the voluntary carbon markets, but we really need to have, I think, an uh, inclusive effort to, to move that that test forward. I won't repeat, of course, climate stress tests, obviously that's been said in, in important part, but we'll integrate proper valuations, I think, in assets as we get um, more developed stress tests and realize what the underlying risks are for different institutions uh, from a prudential standpoint. And I'll end with this, you know, the goal, I think we have to dedicate resources, we have to move towards raising risk management awareness and visibility within our markets and the broader economy so that we can identify where the holes are and where we need to be better to improve the space. Markets are going to create, they're going to be the vehicle for the allocation of capital, you know, certainly from a CFTC space with derivatives, we're going to see trillions of dollars of capital flowing towards um, climate change and climate risk, and we're going to need to hedge and manage that credit risk, that rate risk, that currency risk, and then product developments, both from a physical risk standpoint and the physical impacts that we're going to face over the next couple centuries. And again, this is something that here at the CFTC we're accustomed to, weather derivatives have been around for a number of years. But as these weather events continue to grow in extreme uh, fashion and, and, uh, and uh, sort of um, we see more of them. We have to be more innovative and creative in, in the type of products we develop. So a lot, I think, there, but ultimately markets are going to play a key role in the allocation of capital. And ultimately, it's about creating incentives. If we create the right incentives and we price the assets properly, the incentives will move the capital to where it needs to go. And I think that will dampen the transition risk that we're going to face over the next couple decades and ultimately get us to our end goal of net zero uh, in a few decades to come. Smashing. Thank you, Acting Chair. Um, Alejandro, can I turn to you now to pick up on another of the themes that Glenn mentioned at the start, and that's spillovers, spillovers between assets, between sectors, between economies and jurisdictions. Spillovers are clearly a, a, a theme that, to which Mexico uh, and your central bank uh, is no stranger. Could you tell us a little bit about um, your thinking uh, there in the case of uh, climate-related risks? Happy to do so, uh, Joseph. Um, and I think when we are thinking about how to address the key problems, there are two key issues. One is to understand better the implications of climate risks in order to manage it. And the second, how we can develop concrete action plans and measures to uh, better address this. In, in terms of how we can, uh, the challenges that we're exposed to, and I think small open economies like Mexico, as you alluded to, we have traditional channels of cont contagion from external shocks uh, but now climate uh, change is also uh, uh, increasing the amounts of risks. I will mention four dimensions. One is carbon prices. The second is reallocation of capital flows. The third is financial distress. And four is changing international trade advantages. And these factors entail large shocks on key economic sectors. It can alter financial conditions and disrupt asset prices and financial stability. These risks can have significant direct, indirect, and contagion effects that need to be addressed promptly. Actually, uh, there is research currently being done at Banco de Mexico to understand these complex interactions, and in particular, in the in, on the interplay between transition risks in different climate scenarios and its impact 
on financial institutions and financial stability. And we have highly granular data that allows for these research uh, to, to move forward. And it basically shows that the interconnectedness and common exposures of financial intermediaries are relevant and might significantly increase the size of the initial shock to asset prices. So clearly we know that amplifying effects of the, some of these uh, shocks. And now let me go into, uh, I think, what we need to create a better uh, international conditions to mobilize and accelerate investments in low carbon activities, especially in emerging markets and less developed countries, for the following four reasons. The first is the starting point of the global uh, climate finance uh, agenda is very much focused on developed countries. The emerging economies and LDCs position in this topic and the strategies that are uh, needed to accelerate the progress of the agenda uh, in these regions is not being adequately identified. Second, given the current initial conditions, any amount of investment in climate change mitigation in emerging and LDC countries can have a larger impact and thus a larger positive externality than in developed countries. From this perspective, a dollar invested in emerging market and LDCs can have a higher mitigation potential, thus it makes sense to create the conditions for such investments to be made. It is unfortunate that uh, most needed investment would not be done for cost of funding reasons. Third, also emerging uh, countries and LDCs have less space to spend in climate-friendly projects than they had before the COVID-19 pandemic. I think it is very clearly that the policy space has been eroded by COVID. And fourth, it is essential to move from a bad equilibrium with high financing costs and insufficient green capital mobilization to advance this agenda globally, to an equilibrium with climate-friendly funding sources at scale for these countries and genuinely uh, for, uh, low fin with low financing costs. Such funding alternatives would have positive global externalities and support economic activity and investment in these regions. So I think we need to understand better and mobilize uh, resources and actions uh, to move forward the agenda. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thanks, Alejandro. That's, that's very, uh, very uh, interesting. We have a, a project underway here at the FSB actually looking at spillovers that we saw last year during COVID between economies. Uh, that occurred as a result of the, the, the COVID crisis and, and market stress in March. And a couple of our members are saying the dynamics they saw there, the relationships between different economic variables were very different in the case of a global pandemic to the case of previous financial crisis. And there's a bit of me that wonders, well, maybe in a, in a really severe climate shock or the crystallization of climate related risks, uh, some of these relationships might be might be different again and, and more pernicious in, 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 in terms of the feedback effects to which they give rise. Um, Glenn, last but not least, can we circle back to you on this? We've heard about scenario analysis and the resilience of banks, insurers. We've heard about markets, cross-border spillovers. Is there anything you'd like to add here? Yes, let me... Uh let me uh, second Natalie and, and Sarah's points on climate scenario analysis. Uh, I think that's probably the most promising single tool we have to address climate related risk at this point. Um, financial institutions and regulators are making progress linking climate risk to asset valuation and balance sheet risk. Uh, however, these are early days. We need much more research, research into designing scenarios, modeling the climate and, and economy and gathering and processing the requisite high resolution data. Understanding the connections among the economic, financial, and climate systems will require linking integrated assessment models of the economy and climate, macro finance models that can calibrate financial sector exposure. Uh, several have mentioned the data requirements. Assessing climate risk requires a detailed understanding of the very local effects of climate change. Uh, much progress has been made in, in measuring a high resolution physical climate effects in the United States. Uh, for example, the Climate Impact Lab has, has made much progress. Um, risk assessments require that granular data about the type and location of the underlying assets and vulnerabilities of various physical locations, supply chains, business models. In addition, the extent of climate-related losses by financial markets and institutions depends on who's holding the relevant assets and their risk management and loss-absorbing capabilities. 
Effective climate analysis also requires coordination both within and across countries. It'll be especially helpful to have harmonized expectations around climate risk management practices and scenarios to avoid building multiple systems for different oversight bodies. That's something we hear a lot, uh, uh, sort of this redundancy is something uh, uh, many are, are, are worried about. It's a particular challenge in the United States, which has a very fragmented regulatory landscape. In a landscape with several different bank regulators, market regulators, insurance regulators. So consistency in the face of an all-encompassing threat multiplier like climate risk is important. Finally, let me make the broader point that climate-related risks are not just a challenge for financial markets and institutions. Uh, in this second early uh, uh, discussion of comprehensive, the need for comprehensive assessments, climate change and climate-related risks will have a financial impact on households, non-financial firms, and governments at all levels throughout the economy. Policymakers need to look beyond the financial sector and consider how climate-related financial risks could propagate across the broader macroeconomy. Um, we need a comprehensive, all-government, all-economy, all-society perspective for sex, success on this issue. Thanks. Thanks, Glenn. And I think what I take from all of this is uh, the thinking really has moved on quite substantially since I rocked up at Sarah's desk seven years ago and asked what the hell we were going to do about this climate change uh, issue that, that we hadn't really thought about before. OK, final question from me before we move on to the audience. Um, let's talk about implementation. What would each of you like to do? What are we going to do? What are the levers um, via what policy tools? Um, please be brief. Can I ask you to keep answers, please, to two minutes? Glenn, let's reverse the order and, and start with you. Um, what, what's, your, what's your one wish, if you like, in terms of um, how we try and advance things? I think we've got to worry about um, public acceptance. Maybe this is a U.S. perspective, but we've got to think about designing and conducting climate policy with a, with a narrative uh, that combating climate risk is in the public interest. And it's crucial to build that public understanding and broad-based uh, buy-in. Um, as I said, it's been a particular concern for the United States, but every country will likely face this uh, obligation to some extent. Um, climate policy can be explained as a process of taking out property insurance and life insurance. Um, and that's probably going to be more successful than explaining it as a mandate to eat your spinach, for example. Um, Ideally, people would appreciate that addressing climate risk is in their own best interest. Concretely, I think encouraging joint supervisory and private sector efforts can help bring everyone on board. The financial sector uh, may help to get asset managers, financial managers, other investors engaged. Efforts towards standardization of climate disclosures, as I've mentioned, can also contribute to greater transparency and more importantly, really, a more efficient pricing of risk. To the extent possible, speaking with one voice or at least speaking in a common tongue with an accepted frame of reference may help promote uh, general understanding. I think what makes this difficult, of course, is we're talking about probability distributions, not averages. Um, and that's always, always a, a difficult uh, view to convey. Um, I think we're also talking about a distribution, uh, as I mentioned, heterogeneity. There's a distribution of effects across location with wide geographic diversity. There's also a distribution of impacts across incomes. Uh, climate change is closely related to inequality, uh, which of course can be a difficult topic for transparency communication. But concretely, I think that's uh, one thing I think uh, uh, put it at the forefront is, is, is getting this uh, broad communication. Thanks, Glenn. And yeah, that point on inequality uh, parallels with uh, the effects of COVID there, I think, in, uh, in, in, in some places as well. Uli, uh, your one, uh, one, one wish, please. What should we do? Well, I mean, there's obviously a lot of things that have to happen, but uh, being a teacher, I would like to, to emphasize the need to build capacity to uh, move to practice. Yeah? So we've been discussing a lot of great things, central bank supervisors, ought to be doing 
we need to make sure that they're all equipped to really do it. Yeah? And uh, for the time being, I mean, I, I work a lot with central banks and supervisors, and for the time being, uh, resources are really, really lacking. And, you know, we have, of course, uh, uh, fantastic people uh, at different institutions, but, but, you know, we need to really mainstream that. And uh, so I think uh, that's a really important area, uh, building capacities to carry out all these kind of stress testing, macro, micro prudential uh, uh, policies and all that. And um, I'd like to emphasize here in this context also that um, uh, there's a very important role for international cooperation and international organizations. So uh, the IMF, uh, other international financial organizations, the standard setting bodies and so on. Uh, basically, everyone needs to move in the same direction. And, and I think this, this very conference is actually a very good example of, of that happening. Um, and also, I was very pleased uh, that, that the NGFS um, is also now moving towards this capacity building space. And, and I think uh, uh, we need to make sure that we, we really uh, involve all the necessary actors, including, of course, all the universities uh, across the world. Thanks. Thanks, Uli. Let's not forget the FSB, the Financial Stability Board, as, as well. We, of course, have a, uh, have a coordinating role to, uh, role to play. Uh, no, no question around that. Via our, via our membership, of course. Alejandro, um, what to do? Yes, Joseph. Uh, in, in the concrete uh, domain, I will focus on two issues, on the, our financial sectors and on the international level. In our financial sectors, we need to review capital sufficiency and buffers of all financial institutions, not only banks. We need to include all financial intermediaries to be subject to a minimum of disclosure and risk management practices related to climate risks to avoid loopholes that could generate serious distortions both to the climate and the financial stability agendas. We need to bear in mind that all regulation instruments might be ill-suited to address new risks. We uh, welcome the renewed strong uh, efforts by international organizations to advance and homologate the global climate agenda across countries and this agenda uh, includes uh, upgrade of risk management practices through scenario analysis, enhanced disclosure, address data gaps, and establish standards and metrics. And in terms of what international fora can, can do, I think multilateral institutions can unlock attractive investment uh, funding at low interest rates in ex exchange for credible greenhouse gas mitigation, while at the same time providing capacity and technology resource to LDCs and emerging economies. The potential positive externalities created by MDB's catalytic role in this agenda are, I believe, of historic proportions. This will also increase the resilience of global financial systems to climate uh, risks. We also uh, need to develop innovative structures to diversify risks through, for instance, pulling a large set of projects in many jurisdictions back with guarantee schemes or other de-risking solutions. Blended finance structures can unlock private sector financing of the transition uh, to a low carbon economy. And finally, uh, I think it is fundamental for emerging and LDCs uh, that are more exposed to physical risks to also be able to increase the resiliency of their economies. In these respects, I think IFIs and MDB should develop pre-authorized facility uh, like credit lines or buffers as part of the risk sharing mechanisms to enhance the resilience of individual uh, regions or countries and uh, the global financial uh, system. Uh, thank you, Joseph. Thanks, Alejandro. Um, Acting Chair Ben, and moving back to you, how can we ensure that markets, financial markets, are facilitating the, uh, the transfer and the sharing of uh, risk? What are the implications of markets regulation, do you think? So, Joe, I'm going to answer this question. I, I, I think I have a unique perspective, and, and Glenn can probably share in this. From a US perspective, how much things have changed in just a year, even less. And uh, I'll get to a point of what I mean, but you know, I started thinking about this really in earnest in 2018 and then started some work in 2019. As you know, Sarah was a part of that initial kickoff and that culminated in this in a managing climate risk report in September 19. And it was a big effort. It was a little bit of a risk on my own part because there wasn't much of a conversation in the US. And I think there was plenty of people talking about it, but it really hadn't sort of gained steam and been publicly accepted. Now, I, I say that with caution because I think Glenn's right, it's not wholly publicly accepted that climate change and financial markets and risk involved are connected. But 
my perspective now, having been through that for the past three years, and then where we are today, and having the honor and the privilege of participating in the FSB, in IOSCO, in, in many of these different multilateral organizations globally, seeing the conversation just elevate exponentially in the in the past few years, and I, I think in the past few months, and I think in part because of, of the U.S.'s engagement and, and President Biden's engagement, we're at a point where we have all of these great ideas, all of these potential policy resolutions, much of which have been grounded in both the Bank of England and Bank de France for many years, and, and the Fed. I know Glenn's been working on these issues for many years, but how are we going to coordinate these? We all have different geographical restrictions, whether it's legal or policy or social. And ultimately, as far as I know, and I would welcome a debate with the panelists, is if we don't coordinate very closely, and even if we leave a little bit of arbitrage on any number of regulatory policy issues, we could end up being counterproductive. So as I've spoken with large investors, with large banks and different market participants in the market space, their biggest challenge is we're global in nature, markets are global in nature, how am I supposed to respond and, and sort of comply with uh, a large basket of policies and regulations. And not that we're there yet, but as we move forward with disclosures, as we move forward with stress testing, as we move forward with potential carbon offset markets, a regulated carbon offset market, as we move forward with taxonomies and, and all the different sort of the data sets that we're gonna be building into all of those elements, how are we gonna organize globally? And I think it's very challenging, I think for all of the regulators on a national level to understand the, the challenges that they face, that I face as the chair of the CFTC, that my colleagues at the SEC, the Fed, the FDIC, because we have legal restrictions. We need the message to come from the top, and I'm not suggesting it's not, but we really have to focus on global coordination and talking from the same script and taking the same actions, because otherwise I think this is going to be not necessarily a, a moot or fruitless effort, but it's not gonna be as effective as it needs to be and could be. And I think there's multiple elements. It's getting buy-in, I think, politically and socially, but then as Glenn pointed out, I think rightfully, really engaging the larger populace to understand what climate change is, to understand the relationship and how it's affecting their day-to-day -day lives, whether it's their homes, the insurance ex access, food, energy prices, things like that. Those, I, I, and these are the events that we need to continue to have, but those are the challenges. If I had one wish of how to figure this out and really demonstrate some sort of need for uniformity and, and continuity and harmonization, that's the biggest challenge. And I think that's what we have to work on. I would never say we should go back to where we were a year or two years ago. I'd rather have more people involved and more people and too many people talking than not enough, but we really have to harmonize and, and get on the same message and, and really work together. Thanks, Acting Chair. And uh, for my desk, at least here in Basel, I've, I've certainly, I think we've all noticed the uh, the, the gearing up of, of engagement and emphasis from from your side of the Atlantic in 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 the last uh, few months, which has been uh, been great, and I know very uh, very welcome. Um, last but certainly not least, very briefly, Sarah, if we've still got you, and then Natalie, can we just circle back to this issue of scenario analysis and and what the priorities are there in terms of further work? Sarah, if you're with us, do you want to answer that first, briefly, please? Joe, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, please go ahead. Very good, I'll leave my camera off. Um, uh, okay. Look, what everybody has talked about is the need to build a global green market infrastructure so that every financial decision that is taken takes the risks and the opportunities, remember, from climate change into account and that we start doing that now. The single most successful way through that is to have a solid analytical foundation for that because then the case speaks for itself. It would highlight the risks of a fragmented approach. It would highlight the risks of inaction. It would highlight uh, the imbalance of uh, where the risks might uh, land across developed and developing economies. And so if there's one thing that I would really like is a swing behind the efforts to invest in the analytics and the scenario analysis uh, that we are doing in the NGFS and, and more broadly to help build the concerted case for action and to help build the right way 
to act. There's lots of things that we uh, we get asked uh, to do that are not necessarily uh, the right way to deliver an orderly path to, uh, to net zero. And I think investing in those analytics, contributing to that uh, research agenda, to the policy makers agenda, I think that is the single most successful, uh, the single most likely route to success because it builds the case for action. Okay, thanks, sir. Before we go into the Q and A, uh, Natalie, would you like the last word on 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 scenario analysis and and, and on what we need to do? Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, first, uh, I think it's amazing to see how the fact that uh, we we agree on the diagnosis and we agree on uh, what we should do. So uh, it's uh, uh, first uh, success of uh, of the uh, recent years, but. Uh, it also shows that uh, now we have to deliver and it will be a, a key challenge ahead. And uh, I would like to illustrate this with uh, uh, the example of the climate stress test uh, pilot exercise that was uh, uh, implemented in, by the uh, French supervisory authority in the SEPI. And I think it's, it's crucial to me that a growing number of supervisors carry out climate scenario analysis, but it's not an easy task. So um, in our example, uh, our goals were uh, twofold. First, better assess uh, the exposure of banks and insurers to climate risks. And second, uh, assist the industry to better factor in climate change risks, improve models and identify data gaps. And just to mention the, the complexity of the exercise, uh, we, we try to have an ambitious uh, an, uh, exercise and this uh, ambitious nature lies in the time hori horizon. We already mentioned that it was um, uh, over uh, 30 years because uh, the assessment uh, was until 2050. The method methodology used, uh, the scenario analysis realizing on uh, NGFS scenarios, of course, uh, it's innovative hypothesis, notably the dynamic balance sheet, uh, i.e. banks and insurers had the possibility to adjust their balance sheet to the shocks because it was very difficult to say that they won't move, uh, adjust their balance sheet during 30 years. Uh, it's coverage because we covered both physical and transition risk for more than 50 sectors and the fact that the participating institutions directly assess the risks on the basis of common hypotheses following a bottom-up approach. So you see, um, we attract a lot of interest. It was a voluntary exercise, but a large number of banks and insurance uh, companies participated. But it took several months to, to uh, carry out it. Uh, so what are the first lessons I would say that first, we can do it. So it was not so uh, clear um, up front, and uh, we were uh, very satisfied to see that it really attracted a lot of interest uh, by uh, participating institutions. Uh, second, it shows that um, as a first measure, uh, risk and vulnerabilities uh, for French financial institutions were overall moderate um, with significant impacts on some sectors as regards the transition risk or in some French areas uh, as regards physical risk. But uh, we, thought, we think that uh, we must remain cautious on these conclusions which are subject to large uncertainties concerning both the speed and the impact of the climate change and are crucially dependent on assumptions and methodological difficulties. So um, for us, it shows that it requires considerable efforts and uh, we need to continue to build capacities. And it is therefore only the starting point for further work uh, to improve this methodology. So just to, to give you an insight of the, the concrete actions and the difficulties we can meet. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Natalie. Let's turn now to the Q&A. A reminder to the audience, please, to submit your questions and, and they'll appear on the screen in front of me. Um, 
Our first question is from uh, Pierre, Pierre Monin, from the Council on Economic Policy. And Pierre's question concerns macro prudential regulation. So these are the toolkits that some financial authorities and central banks have developed over the last decade uh, to try and ensure that financial systems are resilient to the sorts of shock that, for example, we saw in the 2008-09 financial crisis. And Pierre asks to what extent those macroprudential frameworks might need to be uh, adapted uh, in order to uh, meet the challenges of uh, posed by climate-related risks. Who would like to take a brief crack at answering Pierre's question? Sarah, can I pick on you from a, there we go, excellent. Yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me volunteer you, please, go ahead. So look, look the first thing that a macro prudential authority needs to do is to try and size the risk. And that is what we are seeking to do through our climate scenario exercise. Uh, and indeed the Banque de France one that Natalie uh, outlined. Uh, in the light of that, uh, we hope to drive improvements in risk management across the system as a whole. The very fact that we are doing this scenario analysis is driving management of risks that are otherwise hidden. And I think only once we have concluded that to understand how big are the risks, what are the firms doing about them? Only then can we look to the toolkit and see is there anything else that we need to do? I think the really important thing to remember here is that we manage the risk by reducing the amount of carbon that is emitted. And that is done in the real economy and ensuring that the financial system is effectively stewarding the real economy on its pathway to net zero is i think our, our intended goal the role of macro prudential instruments uh in that um uh, i think we've got more work to do before concluding on uh on that question but you can be assured that it is on our agenda Excellent. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's walk before we before we start running. Uli, would you like to come in on this on macro? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I tend to agree most of the time with with Sarah, but but I would actually say, um, I think we we have already, you know, a fairly good understanding of of the kind of broader risks, uh, and 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 so I think I would be much bolder. I think we we need we don't really have. Uh, you know, many more years uh, time for for conducting this analysis. So I, I think, um, you know, when it, when it comes to certain particularly carbon intensive uh, activities, um, you know, kind of there are some areas where it's of course you know kind of it's it's more grey, but you know some some areas where, where it's really clear uh, these are very high risk transition or kind of uh, activity that, that that face very high transition risk. And, and I think central bank supervisors need to be bold because there simply is not much time uh to to conduct this this analysis i mean this analysis has to continue but i would i would very much apply the precautionary principle because um we need to get it right pretty soon um and of course we, we need to adjust as, as we go along and and um uh but i think sending some some clear signals from the macro prudential side uh will be very effective and very important Okay, thanks, Uli. Uh, would anyone else like to weigh in on the macro pro, uh, macro pro debate, whether there's work to be done there? Um, if I could, I, I would probably agree a bit more with, Please. lean more towards Sarah's uh, uh, discussion than Uli's. I think, I think we're more still in the risk identification um, than, than risk management. Uh, I agree there's an urgency uh, to this problem. Um, but certainly in the U.S., uh, where, where macro prudential uh, uh, policy is uh, analysis is centered, I think we're still in those those uh, as I mentioned early days. Um, so hopefully, we'll make progress. Joe, I, I would just add. Hello. Sorry, sorry. Just you know, thinking about the two crises that we're dealing with, or at least the one from 2010 following the financial crisis, and what issue this presents, very different 
risks they're a very different crisis and i think demands very different approach strategically from a macro potential standpoint to address them. sarah did you want to come back on this thank you Austin. So, so, so just to add one point, I think we all agree that um, uh, the transition needs to happen. What we are debating is the role of the macro prudential authority in directing that transition versus, for example, governments directing that transition. I think that is a complicated issue, and I think it's really important for central banks, macro prudential authorities, and supervisors to stay firmly grounded in their mandate where the risk is what drives the macro prudential uh, intervention and while there's a variety of future paths that we could follow and our methodologies and our data are still developing uh, uh, there's a need for some caution uh, but i do recognize uh, ulu's point thank you sarah alejandro yes. do you want to come in please yes just very quickly i think that the macro prudence approach looking at long-term risks Avoiding procyclicality, I think it's it's the right framework to think to think about these issues. But we should not jump into concrete uh, uh, determination of buffers or uh, uh, oversimplifying uh, the the topic. So it's the right framework to approach the the problem. I don't think necessarily where yet in terms of the, the narrow buffers that can only apply to some intermediaries. I think we should give some thought into that. But I think it's an approach that we should use. Thanks so much, Alejandro. Time, I think, for one final question, although we might only have, uh, there might only be time for one or two responses. And the question uh, from, from the audience is, to what extent can we be confident that markets are pricing these risks correctly? And if they're not being priced correctly, uh, why is that? Is it data? Is it a lack of cognizance and attention on behalf of investors? Acting Chair Benham, would you like to, in, in half a minute or so, have a crack yes. at, uh, at answering that? Well, I think, look, at, the first thing to mention is carbon. And, you know, it's an, it continues to be an externality in most places globally. You know, we have some different cap and trade programs uh, in different areas of the world, even regionally within the U.S. But ultimately, it's an externality. And without carbon being priced, markets are not, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, including the proper valuation for these assets. And below that, which I think is the major issue, is the data, the information, the disclosures, the stress testing, and all of the back end deliverables that we're going to get from these exercises to truly understand what risk is out there from a lender's perspective, from a manufacturer's perspective, or anyone in between. And once we have that information uh, uh, sort of dug up, at a granular level, then I think you're going to start to see better priced assets and then investors both, you know, creating better incentives and allocating capital in different directions. Thank you, Acting Chair. So all about the data. Does anyone else want to come in on that pricing uh, pricing point? Uh, perhaps Sarah, I might please. add one thing, Joe, one of the things that I hope our NGFS scenarios do is illustrate what the future price on carbon might be if we are to meet our uh, the goals that our politicians have, uh, have signed up to. So at least there, there's some data points for financial institutions to have reference to when they're thinking about the decisions that they're making. Let's be clear, it's not for uh, central banks and supervisors to put a price on carbon, but I do think it is our responsibility to point out where carbon is not priced and where there is the possibility of it being priced in future given uh, political um, uh, commitments uh, and there that is how we take the future risks of that, climate change into account. That, thank you Sarah I'm sorry we're going to have to leave it there let me say thank you to you all for taking part in what's been a very rich discussion. Plenty to worry about in financial stability terms, but plenty of glimmers of, of hope and clearly some, some terrific work going on as well. I think the virtual platform, virtual format has worked reasonably well. We've had a year, over a year's experience now in, in, in doing these events.
Uh, that said, I've been asked to flag that those of you who wish to look at the next, see the next speaker, Jens Wiedemann, please do so via our website because demand for this platform has apparently been so great that it's, uh, it's starting to, to act unstably. Thank you all very much again for uh, taking part. I look forward to continuing the, uh, the debate. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.